Hello everyone, this is China Paradigm, where we, Dashi Consulting, interview seasoned entrepreneurs in China. Hello everyone, I'm Matthew David, the founder of Dashi Consulting and this podcast, China Paradigm. Today I'm with Stéphane Muller-Margot. Uh, you have been in China for decades now, I, I believe 20 or 30 decades in Asia, generally speaking, and China more specifically. You are based in Chengdu now, you are calling from Chengdu, and you have been very involved recently in healthcare um, and technology. You are the founder of China Healthcare Golden Bridge, and you are currently working on projects related to Alzheimer, but also agricultural projects, senior French uh, agricultural product, and uh, you have been working for um, a lot of uh, projects that are in healthcare, including uh, hospitals um, that some of the references which appear on, on, on the website. So thanks very much, Stefan, for being with us. My first question to you is, what's your China story? What, what, could you tell us a little bit of chronology of what you have done with China so far? One experience, actually, I forgot to mention that you have even represented uh, China Railway uh, in, some, um, in some talk or you have worked with them. And so you have a very, very dense um, uh, experience with China. P please explain us your China story. Yeah, it's, uh, thank you very much. It's a very nice history in one way. If we, one day we can write a book or make a film, it would be very nice. Uh, when I was 14, uh, I used to travel with my parents. And I met a lot of people uh, who were traveling a lot. And I was doing, I was reading, okay, uh, uh, Jean-Paul Lucidize, okay, all the business adventure in uh, everywhere in the world. I was very interested about this. And I said, at this time, I was already interested in China when I was 14. I start to, I went to, I went to university. I was working in the stock market. And it was, when I was in the stock market, I was studying Chinese at the same time. And they called me the Chinese guy already at this time. And it was in 1987, it was a very funny history. Uh, a journalist came to see me, I was only 19 years, and asked me about the crack in Hong Kong, uh, what would be the consequences uh, for European stock market and, and the world. And I say I was just a young boy and say, well, I think in one week the stock market is going to fall. And the stock market fall. And time by time, I start to love more and more China. I went to university. And after four years, when I was, was working in Swiss Bank, I, I asked my boss, I said, well, um, is there any work over in China? Okay, you can give me, I say, Stefan, no, I'm sorry. I don't have any job for you. And I was working also, and it's very funny about to say this now, I was working with the son of Carrefour, Thierry de Foray, and they were opening their first a shopping mall in, in Taiwan, but not yet in China, and say maybe one day. Very funny it is. And uh, after four years, uh, it was my end of my studies. Okay, my boss give, gave me a lot of opportunities. And I said, well, it was in 1989, okay. And I said, I, I would like to try to go to China. Why? And my boss said, yes, why not? Uh, I said, I'm going to for six weeks. Can I go for six weeks? He said, yes. If it's okay, if it's okay, you, you, you move from, uh, you tell me and you go after to China. So I went to China the first six weeks. It was in April 1989. And I went to Guilin, I went to Kuomintang, I went to Peking. And for me, it was a marvelous world. And I came back to France and I said, well, boss, I'm going to leave the stock market. And it was very funny because in 1989, going to China, it was something like, well, well, you might be crazy anyway. You know, well, you know what is China? It's so poor. You know, they are not eating. They have nothing. Okay, they are so small. Everything they are. It was very funny. I was crazy for them, and my parents. So my father was. He was so mad at me. Buy me a one-way ticket. He said, "Well, when you want to come back, but don't come back soon." I don't want to see you anymore. You, you love China. You don't want to see you forget your family. So I went to China and I start, I, I was a backpacker for one year and I discovered China. I went to Guilin, Yangshou, Sanya, and I fall in love. You know, I really fall in love. 
One year ago, I have to go back to do my military service, and it was also a very funny history. The general came and said, Why are, what are you doing here? I said, well, I have to do my military service. So after three days, he sent me back, and I was released. So my father found me a work in a, in a very small place in Sichuan, in Panzerwa, a very, a very huge project. It was to doing the, a big dam, 235 meter. Uh, it was very interesting for six months. After I went to Hong Kong and I went to Taiwan to find a work, uh, it was very tough. At uh, this time, China and Taiwan was tough. Uh, you know, you embassy were nowhere. When you speak, okay, I was a young guy. And I start to make some, some trading. I was doing some training in semiconductor uh, for Taiwan. And I sell to China because I'm French. Okay, this was a good opportunity. And uh, I do a lot of work for 10 years. I was traveling around the world, okay, become a very high flyer, okay, uh, making 2 million miles in two years and going everywhere and uh, love and love more China. And, uh, and I, you know, it was, it was marvelous already at this time, but still to be marvelous. And uh, we go, we go on and we go on and uh, I, I buy, I bought a property in Canada and one day one guy say, oh, you work in China? I said, yes. Uh, can you help me? I said, yes, why not? He was a very famous geologist for and working in South America for 15 years, having some very good experience. So suddenly I become an advisor for a CEO in a, for a gold mine. Okay, for a gold mine. You know, like sometimes we just have a dream, a gold mine. Why not? Let's go over. So I went to Yunnan and uh, I went to Xinjiang and I have this chance. I discover a lot of... Uh, very remote place of China that not many Westerners went over and not many Chinese went over. I discovered a lot of minorities over. It was very nice. And uh, time by time, uh, I, yeah, I worked for these people and finally one, uh, one person approached me from China right away, a very close friend. He said, do you want to work with me? I said, for what? And he told me, I know you have a you have a very good friend. He has a very close relation with very high ranking people. Uh, you know, it was 15 years ago. And when you say, uh, well, I have to make a move to work for a state owned Chinese company, it was a big move. You know, I said, well, this is a very good experience for me. I was not very high pay, but I see the other way how Chinese work. I was very interested. I get green light from, from the general manager. Uh, I went to do negotiation in Peru and I went to negotiation in Bolivia. Uh, we went to the, vi the vice president. I made the vice president who came in China and uh, we have a long negotiation with them. Uh, didn't work yet, but Bolivia worked. After seven years of work, they signed a contract between China Railway and Bolivia government to do the train. And this was a wonderful experience. And uh, my boss gave me a lot of opportunity to discover how Chinese people work. And it was fascinating. You know, the way, uh, you know, we are Westerner. And uh, you know what I went and it gave me a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of great things. I learned a lot. In one way is that when I was around the table, some Westerners were asking me, are you Chinese? I said, no, I'm French. So what is the problem? And I find out in many cases in negotiation, Chinese parties or Western parties have the same goal. It's just a way how to say, how to move forward. And this was very interesting. And I find out, and I find out this, uh, it become more and more fascinating because I was on both sides. And this side was um, sometimes mysterious because I have, to, I have to, uh, to represent Chinese people and to be correct with them. And it was very easy in one way. It's how I work first for my China Railway company. And then uh, what brought you to, to healthcare and technology now? Way it brought me to uh, healthcare for two, two main reasons. I know a lot of people in Yunnan province, okay, through the Chinese company, state-owned company, 
uh, one the biggest uh, healthcare uh, telemedicine company, Sampa, uh, with the Ministry of Health, creates a Chinese telemedicine system. And when you see now, this is very important. Uh, when you see the telemedicine in Europe, it takes a long time to discover, to agree, and everything of the medicine and so on. And China was, I would like to say, very open. As many people know, we have uh, 25,000 hospitals in China, but you don't have, you probably have 1,000 or 1,005 good hospitals, and the other hospitals are in a small, in a third town or very remote place, remote village. So a lot of time, Unfortunately, the villagers have to go to, to make 500, 600 kilometers to, to even have a, just a, a simple diagnostic. I mean, this was very a pain okay, for a lot of people. It cost a lot of money for them. Uh, going, it was really an adventure. When you see Yunnan, is really, okay, you go from a home, home, home um, a minority village, okay, it will take probably okay, 16 hours to arrive to Kremlin after they have to queue up. They have to find the right doctor and so on. So it takes a lot of money for them. So the government, the Chinese government, and after sponsored by the Yunnan province government, they decide Sempa will have a telemedicine center uh, in Kunming and also at the same time will be maybe covered by the social security. And this is a very big step if you compare to the rest of the world in France, it's not so long time that telemedicine can be taken. So it was very interesting because you can do telepathology, you can do X-ray, uh, 500 kilometers, so people doesn't have to go to move on and to move on. And now they are connected to 235 hospitals. This was a great experience for 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 me. Okay, even some. When was it? Like, uh, it was in 2009. I see. And, uh, and now, okay, yeah, they are connected to 235 hospitals, and it's, it's, it's fantastic. After they use this system, okay, to be uh, for the, uh, uh, the social earthquake in 2008, of course, they helped also, okay, and, and, and telemedicine in China is very well developed. What do you do for them? Uh, I was... Uh, I was advisor for them because at one moment, okay, the Chinese government want to sponsor them to be listed on the stock market. This okay. was the, the, the really thing. So, and also because I, they know, I know the stock market. And uh, so they give me, uh, they give me a chance, uh, Stefan, why not you help us to give some advice, okay? And also they know I go to uh, South America. They were also very interested to go in South America. They develop a project, some project in Africa. So they were also interested to go to South America. They go to Peru, a very famous person in Peru for, they say, the poor safe, the poor health. These people, this hospital, were taking care of the poor people, making some hospital. They were very interested, but the government changed, changed, and changed. It was very difficult to, to do this system in Peru, unfortunately. Did you, did you feel that you got to all those uh, opportunities because you speak Chinese, and because you have been in China for a while, or there are other parameters which, give, which explain why you got those opportunities. Do you think speaking Chinese was key? Uh, I definitely think that Chinese is very important. I, dis I think also by uh, being in many remote places, I might be a low profile in some case. I mean, in one way that I'm a, a little bit Chinese, but I can understand their issue. And it's very important in one way. I know uh, they know that uh, mm, I adopt a Chinese, a Chinese uh, girl in a, uh, in a leprosy village in Sichuan. So they know my art is coming. But they know also um, my idea of become a French and, and being open with them. And it was also very interesting for them. And it's very funny. Even now, a lot of Chinese companies come to contact me. Even today, KPMG contact me, China KPMG. And it's very funny because maybe I am also on the other side. Okay, maybe I understand a little bit better China. I won't, be a, I won't say I'm an expert because no one is an expert in China. But by being more with Chinese, I probably have a better approach, maybe a better feeling. It's, it's, this is a very... 
which is very important, okay, you know, compared to some people in Shanghai or Peking, it might be a little bit, a little bit different. I see. Um, and you what know, is the problem? Uh, good, good. And, you know, sometimes, okay, uh, when uh, at the beginning you say, uh, Chinese, we say, okay, you are Westerner, you don't understand. Now they know that they cannot say the sentence. I understand Chinese, so you can say what you want, I understand the way. But they also see very well that in many cases, I defend them, I protect them. I don't say, okay, I'm French, so I should do it, or I'm Westerner, I should do it. I take the good and bad and I explain them. Sometimes it's really uh, on both sides also, even Westerners, sometimes I explain, they change their attitude, they change their way. You know, this is very important. Chinese and Westerner, as I said before, they have the same goal, but sometimes it's a way how to say, to say a word, to, to approach, to approach a way. It's, a, it's not the same, but we seem the same. You know, and unfortunately, French and Chinese in many cases are the same. Like, we like to eat, we like to drink, we have a culture. So we have a, a different way how to approach, and Chinese knows this very well too. So what would be the difference? You mentioned two times that uh, we have the same goals, uh, Westerners and Chinese, but sometimes we express it in different way. Uh, how would you explain the different ways? Uh, how would you differentiate them? What you explain? You know, it's, like, it's very funny. I can explain in few words. Like when we play Go, Xiao Wei Qi, the Westerner is a Chinese many times say, oh, you are very direct. In one way, you are very direct. Chinese people will say the same thing, maybe a different way. We put around the corner how to approach. Sometimes we say, do you want? And we know they want, but you, it's, a, you know, it's how to turn around. It's really to be a little bit too direct. But if I, if for example, a lot of Westerners say, oh, Chinese people, they like face. Okay, we cannot say what we want and so on. I say, no, no, it is wrong. I've been in a Simsang, I've been working in a, in state owned company, uh, I have a very open uh, discussion with Chinese people, but I respect and I say a different way. But sometimes the world were very strong, but out of the meeting, I respect them. It's a, very, a little bit different that we can say we agree, but we know on the table we are not agree. We will not. We won't. We are not. We are not agree. And every time, what is different compared to Western? Life, the so Chinese people, even with a dead negotiation, the door is every time open. And this is very important. It's not closed door. It's every time they try to find a solution. For this, that's why I would like to say it's probably their success. Because, yes, sometimes it's a mess, but they cover the mess, they make it well, they go around and they find a way. They every time find a way. In France or in, in Canada, we have laws. We cannot do it. It must be A or B. But Chinese people, we try to find a way. Maybe it can be A plus, plus B minus, but find a way. And this is very important. That's why it's, it's, uh, it's uh, very interesting to do the negotiation with them. You have been working on other projects uh, in healthcare. And I see that you have advised the CEO of Domus uh, Oh, is it uh, six or VI? I don't. I never know. It is Domus V. Domus V. Domus v. So, which is in um, in uh, as 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 far as I know, in a senior care. So, in um, in uh, nursing homes, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. And you have a, a project uh, related to Alzheimer as well. And um, I feel that you have been involved in all in in a few projects linked to the senior economy to nursing homes. Could you tell us uh, what's your perception on this specific industry, which are the senior economy in China? Uh, around, uh, around the time I come and I become old too, uh, we, I might retire in China too, but I have a lot of friends and I become uh, interested in senior care uh, with my brother because in France he's doing a lot of uh, senior care building and everything. But I become involved, directly and indirectly. And I, when we start to speak with the government people, one day the vice minister says, Stefan, I went to France and I really wish 
one day my father will be treated the same. And we start to speak like this, say, Stefan, this can be a very interesting project. And time by time we speak, I went to France, I met a lot of CEO, I met uh, even in China, I met the CEO uh, of Colisee, of Opea, of Domus V, all these uh, nice guys, okay, who are doing a very nice work in, in China, and we try to help a lot of Chinese people. Because um, China now has a huge problem, technically. Uh, there is a huge Chinese culture that kids, uh, children need to take care of their parents. But coming on a coming, okay, in, uh, now we have in China 200 million people who are, who are retired, who need to be taken care. Uh, you have probably 20 million people who have Alzheimer's. So you have a lot of French, of, you have a lot of issues. How to care of these people from anywhere, from going to hospital, from going to Alzheimer's, from going to, to, to be, how to be treated. And Alzheimer's is a very uh, tough solution in China for, for a lot of some time about culture issue. Because Alzheimer, if you translate in China, is dementia. And also, I have a friend in China who is, whose his father has Alzheimer's, and he feel uh, um, poor, I say, he feel kind of shame to, uh, to tell me my father has Alzheimer's. In one way, my father has dementia. So he's, uh, we have already first to start, to start already to change your mind. Dementia is a normal sickness, we can help you. And a Westerner, the approach of dementia is a little bit quite different. When we speak like the people of uh, Colise, Domus V, they have a very nice approach. These are patient, these people are human, we need to take care, we need to give them a beautiful life, even if it's one month, even if it's six months, even if it's one year. And it's so beautiful. Uh, I have been to few senior care uh, institutions in China, one in Colise, and it was fantastic. When you see the people of 85 years having a smile, it's fantastic. You know, they are happy. They go, they have, uh, they do a lot of parties for them, go to karaoke, go do some uh, uh, calligraphy, uh, learn to speak English. You feel very happy for them. And time by time, yes, I feel more interested. And I know uh, France has a chance. We have a very, we have a, some great doctors already starting from uh, Mr. Velas in uh, Toulouse. He came in China 20, probably more than 20 times. And, and they want to help Chinese people, but it's really a huge, a huge approach. Uh, I found a company okay, a few months ago in uh, Genepol. They are changing the way of how to approach Alzheimer and how to... Uh, we have an issue, actually. For 30 years, people were looking in the same way, what is Alzheimer? How it can be approached? How it can be treated? What is Alzheimer? Finally, after 30 years, they, not, they didn't say we failed, but we have to find a new way. And now, agents, they find a new, a, a new way. They didn't take, okay, Alzheimer, we do some, a lot of biomarker. And most of the time, when I come you, to you're talking about a company called Agent, right? Yes. So there is a company working with which which name is Agent. Could you spell the name? A G E N T. Okay. And these companies, they have a different approach. During many years, okay, the doctors were taking blood from the brain, and this is a, this was a, one of the issues. These doctors decide, decide to take uh, from uh, periphery, from the periphery uh, plasma. And they, do, they, they decide to do a different way. They decide to do a uh, test for people who are 50 years, 55 years, 60 years. And finally, they find out that Alzheimer are different, have a different phase. Phase one, phase two, phase three. And phase one and phase two and phase three doesn't have the same algorithm, which is very, which is very strange. But their goal 
to come in China is to do a China biomarker. Means we are going to try to have some plasma of people of 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and now we will find these people again and try to make the test again. How, is it, how it advance? So, so fridge, the goal is in the future, maybe in 10 years, five, 10 years, to have a biomarker. So we are going to do a, a blood test, like you do a physical examination, you, at the same time, you can test if you have some symptom of Alzheimer. This is a goal. So it's very, very, very important. For China, when you have 20 million people, whatever, it's very important. Because now in China, we just go in a community center, we try to make some uh, MRI or X-ray, and we say, okay, they have asthma, but it's a little bit too late. So we can have, we can know 10, 10 50 years, maybe these people might have Alzheimer. So we might have some, find some treatment for them. And this is, a, this is very important and very, in, very in, challenging. Um, in, a, in a sector like healthcare, where regulation is very strong, where the state is very involved, we know that hospitals are public in China uh, and that most doctors actually work within hospitals. Um, how, how can you succeed in China providing a new healthcare solution or services? What, what, what advice would you give uh, to a healthcare company on how to succeed in China? Should it partner with the SOE? It's compulsory. Uh, should they do uh, the same as they did in France and keep the same way or to change radically? What, what would you advise? Oh, it's, a, it's a very hard advice, but uh, I would like to say, first of all, um, it's a win-win solution. Uh, many, uh, doc many Chinese doctors are very well educated in coming from France, coming from Harvard. So they know what we do very well. They invite a lot of French doctors, a lot of Chinese students go in France to study medicine. So we have to do a win-win solution. Uh, and we have probably to do a diff to be a different a difference approach. I think if, if I take the case of Alzheimer, they welcome Westerner to come here. They really welcome. If we find a solution, they know they know very well it's a very very strong issue. So why not working together? And I think this is a case. It's a win-win solution. So in one way. Yes, it's not like to say, I'm a, I'm a king, I'm a French, I'm coming, okay, I have the best technique and everything. No, 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 no. You know, if I, I've met a lot of doctors coming like this, but because they never came in, in China, but after they went to the best university, like Tsinghua or PKU, uh, Peida, uh, Peida International Hospital, when they went to the hospital, when uh, I take an example of a cancer doctor, one of the most famous cancer doctors, he had a certain half a year of China. And finally, when he, when he went to the surgery room, he said, Stefan, how come in, in Europe we have one machine like this, one equipment like this? I saw four in one surgery room. And it is a potential. In France, what we, we know when we see the potential of China, they have a lot of doctors. We can do a lot of, uh, in some, I will use, we are speaking about regulation. Sometimes China is more open than Western. You know, in French, we can say, Lord de médecin, give, uh, give a lot of break, okay? A lot of orders to people and say, no, don't do it, okay? It's not good, okay? You know, we can say telemedicine is one of the special cases. But China is probably more open in some cases. They can say, and, you know, sometimes we call it project pilot. Pilot project, sorry. Pilot project. And you say, okay, yes, we can try Let's try for 50 people, 100 people. If it's work, if it's work. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. In Europe, if we fail, we are bad. But China, you can fail because they know, we already know, everyone knows we give to our kids this, uh, this sentence, when you fail, you can learn. And, and I think this is the beauty of China. I think for a lot of uh, Western youngsters coming here, for doing discovery and to learn a lot of things. Okay, it's fantastic because China is, uh, is very open for this. 
just to keep respect. That's it. How, how, so what are the challenges in terms of um, financing healthcare? Um, would, you, would you say that it's like in France where you need to work with a state to, be, to, to make sure that uh, the patient will be reimbursed uh, and if they are not reimbursed, basically, you know that the market is going to be very hard if you work in healthcare and your product is not reimbursed. What, what, what are the, the key uh, success factors in China to succeed? Do you need to work closely with the state to be in hospitals or uh, actually the patient can buy by himself? It's more the relationship with the doctors. What would you say are the key success factors? Well, if you want, for example, you know, you have to do clinical trials. When you do clinical trials, you have to give money to patients. This is one issue. The second issue, of course, you have to work very close with the government. You have to work very close with the hospital. This is really, a, it's, it's three components, three elements that you must work. The patient, the state, and the hospital. Okay. And, but does it mean that the financing is going to come from, from, from the state or from firms, from uh, the, the patients w- would, would pay actually like in the U.S.? What, what kind of system is it in China? Is it more like the French system? Is it more like the American system where actually uh, healthcare is very expensive? Well, how would you qualify the Chinese healthcare system? The Chinese system uh, has made a, a huge move since a few years, okay? Like you have social security in many big towns, okay? Uh, in, uh, for example, for people from zero to 55 or 65, we are cover like 50%. And after the old people are cover 85 percent. This is IPA, the social security does not exist since many years. Now in public hospital and also in some private hospital. This is, you can imagine, okay, a country of 1.4 billion people doing a social security is not so easy. This is a, it's a huge move. This move has done only be done like since three five years. But yes, one issue in China is to find doctors. This is one of the biggest issues. So, uh, you know, we can say we have queue up, okay? We in China, they need probably, okay, GP doctor, a general doctor, they probably need one million doctors. Okay, nurse, they need three million nurse. Okay, and we don't say about, okay, cardiologists and so on and so on. They have a huge need. This is one of their main issues, to have doctors, to have nurse, and it takes years and years so many times, okay, uh, PKU, PEDA, okay, or uh, other people ask me, okay, Stefan, can you have a French uh, company who can do some training to, to be better? Okay, this is, and to, to, to open classes for them. Okay. Is it, is it the issue mainly in the countryside or it's also in cities? Well, you live in Shanghai, okay, in, in Shanghai is, but uh, you know, you know that when you go to Shanghai Hospital, you have to queue up a lot. But definitely, in a small town, is it's a huge issue because, okay, you know, when Mao Zedong makes a uh, make every town must have a, a, a doctor, like the doctor carry his small bag and carry go to from village to village. I would like to say in many places, like in Sichuan and Yunnan, you have a lot of this. Uh, so these small doctors, we can say, but they are very important. But of course, when you have cancer or this issue, okay, they cannot do it. And this is one of the, this is one of the issue. Okay? It's, uh, they need a lot of doctors. Uh, and uh, they are very, very good doctors. When you take a uh, Huashi uh, hospital in Sichuan, okay, one of the best in the world, or you take a, a military hospital 301, okay, they have the best doctors, some of the best hospitals. But the, but the thing is really, they need, they need, uh, they need doctors and nurses. And it will yeah. take years and years. And if we take senior care, it's the same issue. And also senior care take another issue because we speak about dementia and dementia is another way to explain. And it's also a little bit to explain in a culture, in a certain way. There is kind of a paradox that uh, Chinese doctors Actually, I said to be good, um, maybe not enough, en- enough of them, but I said to be good. Equipment seems to be good as well, as you mentioned uh, just before. Uh, but still, medical tourism, 
has, has boomed over the last decade and more and more hospitals overseas get Chinese patients. How do you explain that medical tourism is such, um, is such a trend, has been so successful? Uh, we are, there is, there is a two way. There is two ways I would like to say in medical tourism. Uh, I would like to say it's not French, but most of the time it's America. If we take America, like uh, you, you do a bypass, in America it will cost probably okay, $150,000. And maybe in China will cost less money. So this is very important to come here, to come in China. And very funny, Chinese people, in some case, they don't feel, but this was five years, eight years ago, they don't feel so, uh, so safe in one way. And they prefer to go to, to, to America to, to, be, to be treated. Uh, this is really the issue. And sometimes also the issue is because you don't have so many hospitals, you have to queue up for, for many months. This is also one point, you know. Uh, even, you know, in France also, we sometimes for some operations or for some surgery, we have to wait. In China, you really have to wait instead of uh, instead by passing some other way. But this, this is the main issue. It's not, there, is not, there is not enough doctors who are queuing up. Okay, so they say, why not? I'm going to America. I have cancer. I prefer to go to America. It will take me, I, I will be, I will be in one month treated. This is the case. And American I people see. say, well, I have, to spend, uh, I have to spend too much money. So why not coming? Okay, China is a good place. Okay, Thailand is a good place too. So they come here. There is a, you said there is a shortage of doctors. Um, there is a shortage of number of hospitals. What is um, um, making, not, making it not possible to get more doctors and, and hospitals? Is it because actually... The, it's not profitable enough, it's, 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 it's state-owned, uh, so uh, the, the, there is not enough money actually to, to fund it. How do you explain this? There, is, there, is, there are many issues. First of all, okay, if you want to take the rate, okay, like in America or like in, America or like in France, how many hospitals we should have in China, uh, now we, they have uh, 25,000 hospitals, uh, Half of them are private hospital, and the other one is a public hospital. But if but they should have 50,000 50, hospitals. So you see, really okay, <laughs> it's really one issue. The second issue, yes, there is not enough doctors, and you know, to be a doctor takes a lot of time. To be a nurse takes a lot of, of years. So it's not the money issue. It's not. It's not really. It's a training to be ready. Okay, it's and time. You, you speak, and, and the third time, yes, you speak about the hospital. Now more and more the hospital try to, to work a different, a different way. Like, for, for example, orthopedic hospital, before they were not taking a package. They were working like uh, 25 years, like in France, they were every, doing everything in detail. Like you, you have an injection, you put injection, you have pensement, you put pensement, you have, okay, HO, you put HO, okay, everything, every element you have to put inside. And time by time, Chinese people try and doctors try to find a better way, like to do some package. And you know, like three, five years ago, we were speaking about orthopedic package. It was very interesting. Okay, for the same surgery, okay, it was the price was uh, sometimes thirty-five thousand renminbi, and the one was sixty-five for no for no specific reason, and it was so wide, and no many people can understand. But now, also because they try to make the social security and also with their insurance behind, the insurance say, well, we cannot do this, okay? If you want me to, to reimburse, we need a price. So now when you come to hospital and when you want to work in insurance, you say, well, this package will cost you 30,000. 30,000 over, you won't be reimbursed. So now, now patients are also looking, this hospital can be, I can be reimbursed, how much and how much. So, Chinese, also the Chinese government tried to have the hospital to be profitable because also for many, many years, 50% of the, of the sales of the business of an hospital was for medicine, okay? This was not for operation, it was only for medicine. It was incredible, okay? Now they change a little bit because before you have a, a lot of broker, okay, selling medicine. So finally you buy, at the beginning was, the, selling for one mile and at the end of, at the end of uh, in hospitals, you were selling for one renminbi because you have to pay a lot of commission. So the Chinese government now makes some rules, no more, no more uh, 
uh, no more than five or ten brokers in middle, in the middle. Okay, each uh, uh, each uh, medicine has to be to be ruled on the price. Okay, so people are now are taking care also about this. Okay. Uh, just one thing on the video. Uh, I, I'm not seeing you anymore. Yeah. Oh yeah. Now it's Sorry. good. Okay. Good. Um, let's switch to the other topic you wanted to you you mentioned before before we started. Uh, so. You're working also uh, on an agricultural project, um, a Sino French agriculture, agricultural park or project. I've seen a lot of those very big projects where uh, France and China or one country and China would build uh, something big like a park, uh, government uh, driven. It looked uh, for me a lot like wishful thinking. Like, we are going to do this and that, but at the end, uh, it seems to be very remote somewhere where it's difficult to try to get leverage, uh, to get traffic and so on. What's your view on those very state-driven projects um, and, and their success? Yeah, well, um, you know, in... Uh if we take the province of Sichuan, okay, Sichuan have tried a lot of, uh, okay, a lot of a technology park. It works, yeah. but yes, it takes time, it takes time, and I think that no one, everyone is prepared to do it, okay, uh, technically. When it takes time, how much does yeah, it, how much time does it take when when it's when, when the government starts talking about it and when uh, it's, it's getting momentum? Five, ten years? No, 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 no. I, I think in three, five years, it's okay. And I think it's not too bad, okay? You know, it, 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 it have a long term. Long term, they know what they want, okay? If you see uh, Chengdu, okay, the French park, okay, French Electric Park, when you have uh, Peugeot and everything, it takes many years. Uh, I think it's also, also the backup behind, okay? Uh, you know, about the law, about uh, uh, do I want to come? Uh, you know, you have also to... We have also to say, if I take the, this park and as a Sino agriculture park, France has an issue. We speak about French in one way. Uh, a lot of French companies are willing to come. But China, uh, China needs a lot of negotiation, not, uh, needs a lot of travel. And a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of French companies don't have this huge uh, budget to come back and worse okay yeah. this is really an issue okay like and working the same way as in france like you know i met a lot of french people saying okay okay we uh, okay we sign an mou oh it's fantastic yeah but mou it take probably 16 months 18 months and many mou are dead yes it is right okay we can say it is right in many cases but uh because after many cases they want to work with a lawyer and the lawyer is very good but china one thing are very like a they like to do negotiation face to face, not to pass through the lawyer. You pa you first, okay, it's like, you know, you have to know these people. You speak face to face and after we call the lawyer because you can spend a lot, a lot of money for lawyers in China, a really a lot of money. 1,000 euro an hour or 1,500 euro an hour, is this is a common price. And this is very, uh, and, and when you know, when you see how Chinese do the negotiation, Okay, very fast. Okay, you arrive to 100, 200,000 euro without doing anything. And this is not really the right way to work out. So we have to help them. And this, we have to help them to do the negotiation and, uh, and to take step by step. Yes, you don't, when you want to come to China, you don't want to say, okay, I sign an MOU tomorrow, I'm going to come. Not at all. You have really to prepare to say, what well, is going to take 18 to 24 months? This is the right time. And after when we start 36 months, I think this is really, and how I'm going to spend my money, I have to be prepared, really. So you have really, you really need a, a certain budget. Some company are doing very good by um, uh, doing some, uh, structurate some bigger, uh, some deal together so they can bring more company together. It's very important to, to come in a group to, to try not to, 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 to lose the contract. Thank you very much for your time, Stefan. Uh, I think there are other topics we could have talked uh, about. It's already uh, already one hour, um, especially the, actually uh, this topic, the last topic, 
about the, the construction, the building of a park could be could be maybe an other episode. Congratulations for everything you did uh, and all your, your your experiences, which are very wide. Um, thanks again for taking time on on your Sunday. Uh, merci. Thank you very much. I really appreciate. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed and hope everyone enjoyed the talk. Bye bye everyone. Thank you.